Hello everybody, it's Roy Mills here. Um, just doing a slide talk about a project that I think should be kind of interesting for people who are looking at doing some uh, sculpture perhaps for the first time or um, I want to try and encourage you to think about um, uh, sculpture as an event that's a part of your lives. Um, there was a couple of subsequent um, uh, videos that I have uh, that tie into this, one on Gestalt theories and uh, other one um, on um, what is a line that hopefully you've seen already and that will give you some you know, thought about the rhythm of visual events and such um, that would be really significant to this. So we're looking at, um, um, you know, how to arrange form in such a way that it's it's compelling. And I think there is a truth that, that we're looking at. So this shouldn't take too long, this video, but um, look at the images and, um, you know, consider that there is a kind of a truth in the way that we perceive things. The distance between us when we're standing in a public uh, arrangement with uh, people we don't know and then a yeah, different sense of space relative to people when we do know them, um, how we address people with our shoulders, our hips, all of those things I think we can kind of assume we all agree on. Um, but there's more and I think sculpture is an interesting part of it. So um, in terms of this uh, project, uh, Unit 2, I'm calling it, um, you know, it may come into um, groups in the future at a different stage, but um, I want you to do iterations. I want you to make some drawings, just the size of postage stamps. Um, there's three seconds worth of music. Uh, re you can choose from Dave Brubeck, and you could do three seconds from Miles Davis in So What? And um, in those three seconds, really analyze the rhythm of auditory events and try to do some little drawings, just little drawings the size of uh, a postage stamp or something like that, that maybe relate to the, the, the flow of the music in some way, that it's about a feeling. Um, so these, neither of these uh, tunes that I've chosen for you guys to draw from have any lyrics. So there's no sort of uh, reality to it other than a feeling. And um, I think it's really important that even when we are do, dealing with something that is representational, that we have that feeling as the motivating force behind everything. So, so yeah, you're just going to do tw make sure you do 25. Um, I could easily do 25 in you know, less than 10 minutes. So that's the kind of thinking, and I have some examples coming up about that. So the other part is um, I'd like you to make a, a set of two or three or even more little sculptures, you know, sort of the size of a shoebox lid or, you know, it could be a little smaller, a little bigger, whatever you feel like. But you, just using a simple material like shish kebab skewers or, uh, you know, chopsticks or, you know, you can use some wooden dowels or whatever you want. And um, think about the aesthetics when you're doing it. You can relate it back to the music. You could kind of relate it to the iteration little sketches that you're making. Um, you know, those sketches are, probably won't mean anything except when you think about them in relationship to the mu music. But when you try and translate them into wooden dowels or something, skewers or whatever, you know, sticks, branches, whatever you end up using, um, there'll be a transformation happen and it should be a surprise to you and, and the joy in that is something very special. So um, you can freestyle if you want and just leave the, the music behind. That's fine too. But basically I just want you to kind of do what you would do if you're doing a set of, of drawings leading up to a master work of you know, representational painting or something and that is you'd warm up. So you know, people think, well, I'm now I'm doing a sculpture. I'll do it like a masterpiece. Let's not do that. Let's do a bunch of little sculptures and, and then, uh, you know, get used to it. So um, get used to dealing with material and thinking quickly with material that way. So um, in the end, I want you to get great photos of those little iteration sculptures, the three, three or more. Um, and I'd like you to get down with your camera lens, not just the cell phone, because it's a pretty big object, um, get down with the lens until it's about, uh, you know, five centimeters or something like that off of the, the, the level of the bottom of the sculpture so that the sculpture seems big.
And that'll give you an option later to Photoshop it or um, photo montage it into uh, an actual real world venue. Um, I want to kind of introduce sculpture to you guys as an option that could see you doing a big public commission someday. So that's what this talk is kind of hopefully leading to. So. And then, so that's number three. Number four, make a sculpture that you love using the same humble materials. So, you know, shish kebab skewers, chopsticks, sticks, twigs, whatever you can find. Um, hot glue gun, thread, could be rubber bands, like whatever you use. Um, make a sculpture that's not a model, right? So try to get something that's got, um, you know, all of the aesthetics that you would use. Um, so sometimes when you're just putting shish kebab skewers together, they just look like a jumble. They're all, the, the joints that you make are equidistant and the sculptures kind of looks like an even rhythm. So you're going to have to cut them and change them. You might want to have something that's visually structural relative to gravity, so perfectly per perpendicular to the horizon or perfectly horizontal to the horizon and parallel to the horizon, those kind of movements end up creating a kind of structure. Anything in dynamism off of that is going to look like it's tumbling or somewhat organic. So you can think of structure versus anti-structure. Um, you can think of it as human will versus natural serendipity. You could think of it as resistance or relenting to gravity. You think of it as orthodoxy, unorthodoxy, or even take it into a political realm and let um, structure re represent perhaps Republican and anti-structure <laughs> represent Democratic. And now I'm stretching things, right? But it gives you an opportunity to think of abstract music and abstract form as a representation of different kind of aspects. And I'm not presenting them like, you know, conservative is good and liberal is bad or vice versa. My point is that if you put the two things in one sculpture, you're kind of saying that they're both needed. So I'd like you to think about that while you make uh, this number four sculpture, which is kind of like the refinement of all the ideas. Um, yeah, so um, you're going to have to take great photographs. And I put some, you know, there's a video in, in your uh, e-class about taking great photos. So go and look at that. And then um, I want you to collect as many images of real world venues that would be great for your sculpture to be in. So in this little talk, there's some uh, reference to that too. So here on the left are, you know, this is a zoom in. So these are very small, only each one about the size of a postage stamp. And I do them all the time, always thinking. And so I'm just running through ideas vertically. So on the left, there's a tall vertical with a thing squirting out sort of on the right. And then that same, you know, coming down vertically, then it's all down low. And then the next one down, it's even more down low. So the heaviness is giving in to gravity in a way. And so when you come to the row on the right, there's a heavy thing above this small thing. And then I'm sort of letting it lean to the right and talking about it relenting and giving in to gravity in a series of sequential moves. Now, are any of them a good idea for a sculpture? I'm not sure. But what I'd like you to do is kind of draw a frame around it. And I didn't do that in any of these because I don't think I actually would do any one of these ones as an actual sculpture, but it, they get me to ideas that I would do. And, but when I find one that I like, I'd like you to draw a horizon line in, as you see in several of these images. All of them? Yeah, all of them have a horizon line drawn in. And that would be eye level, right? You know from linear perspective studies that the eye level is the horizon line. And then there's an actual sketch that I did on the right when I went to make a sculpture in India. And I, I made that sculpture and I was trying to relate to the trees and the way the sculpture would sort of borrow the energy of the cluster of the canopy of the tree and into the rock and down into the 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 rhythm of visual events in the stones and then up the other side so yeah so this is what you're going to do so these are some small iterations that uh, Johnson Long made and then uh, on the left those four are all what we'd call catalog images so I want you to get catalog images and then later I want you to try and photoshop some of those so you see in the middle image uh, with the green grass. Um, Doreen uh, 
wove some rubber bands together and then used, rather than chopsticks, she used just twigs. And so this sculpture is only, you know, four centimeters high, five centimeters high or something. It's quite a small one. But she, um, you know, photoshopped it into a landscape that she liked. And then on the right-hand side, Esther Lee uh, did this really great thing with some, I think it was a little bit thinner than, no, no, those were shish kebab skiers. Those were the thin shish kebab skiers, and she made a kind of a boat. And then, um, you know, she took her um, catalog images, and they were really good, but um, this was the Photoshop version that she got. So this is what I would say is, uh, you know, more of a document uh, kind of photograph. Shadow's really strong. Strong, so that's a single solitary light source and then this one too this shadow is kind of almost more important than the sculpture itself but um, I mean you can try some various versions but when you look at the um, the photo video that I put for, made for you guys um, those images generally are just diffused light trying to show off the sculpture itself something like this so these are all just using sticks and twigs and, you know, the goal is to get our attention, draw us in and hold us longer than we first thought. So you can do that in any number of ways. Um, both of these, I think, have absolutely excellent appropriate craftsmanship for the type of sculpture they are. I think it's quite surprising to see shish kebab skirs do what they are on the right hand side. But I think both of these sculptures are equally excellent and outstanding. So um, for the full-size sculpture, that one in the middle might be a good example of that. The one on the left could be a middle-sized one with a railway train, you know, a train model train figure in there. I think it's a real image. It's actually a real image, and it's a real person. But your sculpture could be photographed with a railway figure in it if it's small. And it could be presented as if it's a really big sculpture. So, But for the the... The part of the unit where I'm asking you to do something that's not a model, these two on the in the middle and on the right are actually, you know, they're pretty big things, right? Probably, I don't know, the thing on the left is probably three feet tall, and then the one on the right's, you know, two and a half feet tall or something like that. And so you can really think and play. So, like, I'm not going to direct you too much in how you do it. Um, you know, obviously the one on the left isn't about music, and neither is the one on the right. But um, there's an intensity about both of them. Um, you feel, a, a, on the left, a, a sense of volume, but it's almost clogged with the sticks. And so the volume's almost becoming a mass, whereas on the right, it's, there's, you know, you could say, well, there's a house and then there's like a dreamlike cloud coming out the bottom of the house. And then how is it held up by that wire that goes to the right? It's so light. So maybe all our hopes and dreams about houses and dream homes and family and everything is really supported by a little thing. And so the volume in that one seems ethereal full of air, full of dreams, and whereas the one on the left seems slightly more massive. So in terms of, uh, you know, not models, uh, Andy Goldsworthy travels the world, and he, all he does is go wherever he goes and uses whatever he finds to make work. So in this case, most of these images are involving sticks that are very similar to the kind of sticks you might be using, and you can go big if you want. I don't have any problem with that. You can do something really surprising. Some of you are, you know, sequestered and so you have to work in a smaller venue and that's okay too. Um, in the middle uh, you can see Goldsworthy going and picking up uh, red leaves, then orange leaves, then yellow leaves and just finding them in an autumn scene and then arranging them around a circle and he, and he often does that kind of circular thing. So here's some on the left is somebody that sort of borrowed some of Andy Goldsworthy's attitude and way of working and on the right is an Andy Goldsworthy where he's actually just used uh, uh, saplings and I don't know if there's they're all were living but he usually doesn't chop down things so I think it must have been deadfall of some sort but quite beautiful and a really great supportive venue and the one in the red same thing very gray neighborhood feels like some sort of you know Wall Street or well, not exactly Wall Street, I don't think, but anyways, it's, you know, a gray scene, and those red sticks, like, they they must be two-by-fours or bigger, just thousands of them, and, you know, it's pretty exciting. So you can go small, 
can get really detailed if you want. Um, both of these have a lot of commitment to them, and one's quite playful and one's quite severe. So don't forget about the equation. Um, you can look this over and think about it, but these are the things that go into making something have a quality aesthetic experience. Keep it in mind. When you're looking at lines of sculpture, like this is not exactly a line, but it does seem to flow from left to right, and it does seem to kind of feel like almost a musical sort of rhythm. And uh, these were fundamental students' works from a number of years ago, and I, I did ask them to choose their own line of music and try and represent it using the forms. These are really good images. Like They're excellent images. They are not photoshopped. They just um, lifted up the block of wood until the little sculpture was at about eye level. And then they took the photos doing that. And I think they're, they're both very good sculptures, and I think they're quite beautiful images. So when it comes to designing something using models, um, I often do this, so I want to share a little bit of my own work coming up. Um, this is a student work uh, still, but it's a horizontal one, right? And we often think of sculpture as vertical and therefore heroic, you know, human figures, um, you know, and you know, we often do big things thinking that will inspire people. But sometimes a horizontal thing is, a, is more like a place to sit or a place to be. So this was a sketch-up version of an idea that I made for a, a sculpture that related to the last student sculpture, actually. And I can't remember if I was teaching when I made this sculpture, but this was iteration one, and so I was talking about iterations. And eventually we came to this and thought of the two verticals that support the rock on the left with the bowl in it, the verticals being like, somewhat like books and knowledge, and then holding up nature, the bit stone at the top, and then the next sequence is a horizontal book kind of form with a stone uh, penetrating through. And then the foreground is nature alone, and in the final work, actually, we had a component of human-made form uh, supported by the by nature. So there's a kind of a sequence of things. And so the idea was that we'd make this place where in the quad at Augustana campus and of the University of Alberta in, in Camrose that people could just go and sit. And then they could actually take that um, mallet up and, and they could ring the bell as a ceremonial thing and let the campus uh, absorb the sculpture as a place to go and a way to celebrate or to mark occasions and so they seem to use that so the macro rhythms the rhythm of visual events and all of that hopefully you find satisfying but also the micro view was something i was really interested in so people could take a piece of paper and then lay it on there and then take rubbings so on the left is the cuneiforms and so the cuneiform writing no human um, in our era has ever or while well, we've had writing has ever deciphered what those things mean and then on the right is one of the largest installations uh, sculptural installations in Alberta it was done by Keith Harder it's called Gravitas and it's down by Nanton and it's got real full-size airplanes from the First World War going around in a circle and so you know people won't know that perhaps in a few years like maybe Keith will retire and but I, I thought it was still worth marking so so yeah um, I want you to think about like you're just a heartbeat away from being me like I know we're a lot of years apart maybe in age but man it goes by fast and I want you to dream that like, it's very possible for you to take some lessons I'm teaching you and end up in a position where you can make a sculpture um, and um, have a community get behind the sculpture and actually use the sculpture as an inspirational kind of place to go so I really believe in it, and I really believe you can do it. So here's an undergrad student that went to the Digital Stone Project where I've gone. Um, I've, I have a piece in Italy right now getting milled. So she made this. I thought it was a terrific piece, really interesting, kind of comical in a way. Um, and then um, just uh, in kind of rudeness, I, in, I wasn't trying to be rude, but trying to give a bad example of what a sculpture might be 
like a bad place to put a sculpture. So I put it here at the Spanish steps in, uh, in Rome. It's way too tight. Like nobody wants that sculpture that big to be in that plaza. But it is kind of an interesting, like if you're going to try some ideas, you may, may as well try it, anything you want. So that whole idea of serving the community, I think you can still serve things that you have heartfelt concerns for. And that's why I ask you guys or ask all my students always to write, you know, 50 things that you value about being alive at this time in your life. So uh, my sculpt, my, uh, the sculpture on the left features a, a digital copy of uh, a stone from the headwaters of the North Saskatchewan River. Um, that's basically the location where my oldest brother wanted his ashes scattered when he passed away. And so we were up there looking around, and I picked up this stone and brought it home. And then I got invited to go to Digital Stone Project. So I made uh, a scan of the stone exactly. There's a loop at the bottom. The loop at the bottom um, kind of reminded me, or I, I actually made it out of wood uh, and then scanned it too. So those two components. And then I combined uh, some other things within the virtual environment. But I was thinking of a kind of a, a linkage between upstream and downstream. So nature being upstream, Lake Athabasca being upstream. And then this linkage that goes right by our house in the North Saskatchewan River and then on towards Edmonton downstream. So human made things downstream. And I think we're connected, right? Like we're connected upstream to the these beautiful na nature situations. And it's precarious, right? Like we, we're threatening to let nature down in some ways. And I was looking at the um, kind of funerary sculptures uh, that have been done for military and, and you know, the somberness of, you know, losing a brother and, and you know, the somberness of possibly losing nature. And, and he was a terrific hiker and a terrific naturalist. And so I made this sculpture and, and, and I think it, it, I think it is you know, kind of good in a way, but it was mostly about me dealing with things, something that I needed to do. So on the left, you see it on display in an in a exhibition at uh, Fort de Marme, uh, which is a pretty swanky uh, region on the coast of Italy. And then on the, in the middle is a sculpture featuring the actual rock from Lake Abraham and um, the wooden loop at full scale. So, you know, I changed some things when I made the marble one. And I didn't make the wooden one until after I'd made the marble one. I just had the rock and the loop. So um, the logic and thinking of these things, um, they're kind of tied together. So I wanted the sculpture to be rather rigid. Um, a little bit of dynamism so it might be about sliding. It might be about um, catching your breath, um, you know, paying homage. And then I got done, and we haven't done anything about global warming. And I happened to see the Leocone sculpture on the right. Um, while I was in Italy, it's supposedly one of the most dynamic sculptures that humans have made. But that writhing snake and the idea that everybody's in turmoil, I thought, well, I'll make a sculpture that's using the rock from Lake Abraham. I'll stretch it within the virtual environment. I'll use the loop. You can see the loop in the bottom. And then I'll use a shackle that I use every day for lifting things in the sculpture studio and I'll distort it like a serpentine snake. So I made this one that you see on the left. So you look at that and then I'll switch over. So on the left, I've made it taller and a little bit more elegant. And so that's a just a 3D print in plastic, but that sculpture in that form is what I finally settled on as the iteration. And it was partly because after I went to Italy, I went to India and made a sculpture there. And um, I was greatly influenced by the dynamism of these Hindu sculptures. And so I let that affect me. So you can see the original sculpture on the right that was done in Italy. Um, but I photoshopped it into this environment in India just to kind of think about, like, they have these really solemn um, kind of little micro temples that I really have always loved and really cared about. And so, like, just trying to tie my work to what I love and appreciate. So I want to encourage you to do that. And it ends up that, you know, I've gotten some great opportunities to do that. So when you look at all of these images, it's pretty easy to say that the middle image features the you know, the now being milled sculpture in Italy um, as a virtual thing in a 
somewhat realistic environment. And then which of the other ones are actually models and which of them are, are real environments? Well, in the upper right is a Photoshop of a model, an actual physical model that I made. And then in the end, that's the sculpture that I built at uh, Twilliger Park underneath it. And on the left is another part of Twilliger Park. And then this final image is just um, kind of reminding me to tell you that in the end you can serve your community um, by doing things that you deeply need to do for yourself um, with access um, to the community. So you can look online and, and on my website and read all of my, you know, the gobbledygook words that I might say. I mean, I'm undermining it by saying gobbledygook, but, um, you know, like they're honest thoughts, but sometimes I think the words ruin it. If you read too much of what an artist says, sometimes I feel like it takes away the connotations that you make for yourself. So there you go. Make some sculptures out of ratty old, uh, you know, shish kebab skewers and whatever, and I think you're going to have a chance someday after you've made enough of them to maybe get to do something to serve others in a really terrific way. But start now. Good luck, you guys.